Hello and welcome. Once again, this is Phil, and today we're going to take a quick dive into a really important topic for all digital forensic practitioners. We're going to talk about timestamps. Now, if you saw the title of this video and you were confused as to how something as simple as a timestamp might be important enough for us to cover here, well, you must be one of the lucky folks in the field who have never had to deal with this problem before. So congratulations. But in all seriousness, if you saw the title and immediately thought, oh yeah, that's a big topic, then I know you've dealt with this problem before and you understand some of the hassles and headaches that timestamps can introduce. So that being said, let's take a look at this surprisingly vast topic. If you were to survey any group of people about how they prefer to represent values of date and time, you'd probably get almost as many responses as there are people in the group. You might hear things like just the date value, and even this can be varied because this is culturally influenced. Here in the United States, we typically represent our values in month, day, year format, whereas in most of the remainder of the world, it's represented as day, month, year because putting it in the United States form is seen as counterintuitive. I'm not saying which one's right or wrong, but this can be a vast difference depending on whether you're looking at January 5th or May 1st, of course. Depending on who's reading that could interpret it very differently. You might also get a response back that is just the time value, and this can also vary. You might get a 12-hour form with AM or PM, or you might get that in 24-hour format as well. And although we don't typically include the time zone when just casually discussing things like time, this is really important too because this could be a, as much of a difference as almost 24 hours, depending on which time zones you're looking between. So this can be important as well. Now, those are just the date or just the time. You might see these combined with both the date and the time together, or maybe somebody's going to say this as the time and then the date. Obviously, you're starting to get much, much more varied. And sometimes, pun intended, the timestamp isn't even intended for a human. It's really intended for a computer to parse which represents itself in many different formats, but it's the exact same date and time value. It just might not make any sense typically to you and I as humans in its native form. Even when it is for us humans, there are some formats that are more commonly used and some that are just one-offs or fairly rare, and some look intuitive, some very, very complicated and require knowledge of what the format is. So it's very, very difficult to look at a value and understand exactly what date and time that is. And on a complete tangent, if you've ever used spreadsheets like Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets, you know that both of these tools have this uncanny tendency to take some values that you enter and turn them into dates and times that you didn't actually mean. Fun times when you're trying to just represent a number and it turns into some kind of a date value that you didn't expect. So there are practically an infinite number of timestamp formats that might be used, but let's take a look at some of them that'll be a little bit more common, the ones that you're more likely to encounter in investigative work. A lot of the work I've done in DFIR cases has been investigating Linux systems, and I've also been a Linux system administrator for many, many years. So we'll start there. But this is also relevant if you find yourself doing any kind of investigation or research that's involving embedded systems or a lot of the IoT systems because these also typically use some form of a Linux operating system. Regardless of what the distribution is, with any Linux or Unix-like operating system, the logging daemon that's in use is called syslog or a variant thereof, and it's been around for a very, very long time. Its timestamp format is unusual compared to what you might expect. As you can see here, the timestamp in this entry looks, well, weird. First, there's a three character abbreviation for the month. That's not typically used. Then the date value, the day of the month, is in fact a space padded value. So if it's less than 10, you have more than one space involved here and no leading zero. And then you finally have the timestamp. But as you look at this, you can probably jump to a quick understanding that this is not ideal for a couple of reasons. There is no year value included. There's no indication of time zone. And the abbreviated month means now I need to go into do string parsing and comparisons, and that doesn't necessarily equate to a simple computational process. But this is not something that somebody just invented. This is the date format that is defined in RFC 5424, which also defines the overall syslog protocol, including what its timestamps are going to look like. Very common for you to encounter this on those Linux-like systems because, again, this is the default. Another common format that we'll encounter quite often is called epoch time. You might pronounce it epic time, tomato, tomato, but I pronounce it epoch. But epoch time measures how long has elapsed since some fixed start point that's defined as the origin for that particular time system. 
Most commonly, this is going to be what's called Unix Epoch Time, which is the amount of time elapsed since January 1st, 1970 at midnight UTC. And this is most commonly represented in whole seconds since that time. If you were to look at a timestamp today, this would be a 10-digit integer, typically starting with a 171. But if your logs are particularly old, or if you're using this format to represent some kind of time in the more distant future, it would of course be lower or higher. As the example shows here, 10 digits starting with 171. This particular value happens to correspond to May 14th, 2024 at 5, 12, and 13 seconds p.m. UTC. This just happens to be a Tuesday for what it's worth. Now we can calculate this using some kind of a tool like maybe CyberChef to convert that integer into human readable form, but this format in its native form really doesn't do too much for you and I as human beings, especially if you need to know what time maybe your dentist appointment starts. However, it's actually really useful for computers because if you have this time value, sorting chronologically means sorting numerically. It's a very concise way to represent those extremely large times, and it's typically represented by a 32-bit unsigned integer. So it's nice and compact, and it's a fixed width regardless of what the time is up until when this will eventually expire. Now, this is in seconds format. We also have other variations of Unix Epoch time which might be down to milliseconds or even microseconds. And in those situations, of course, you'll see that the value will extend to 13 or 16 digits long, respectively, but it's still the same basic concept. I'll always say that, well, we humans aren't really good at mentally converting these timestamps to something that we're going to understand. It's a really useful skill for us to have in the DFIR practice to at least recognize potential Unix timestamps so we can convert them and determine if there's any kind of relevance or any kind of meaning to the case that we're looking at. So being able to recognize a potential Unix epoch time is more important than being able to do that math in your head, of course. Another epoch-based timestamp format is used by Microsoft Windows for many of their NTFS file system timestamps and some Active Directory timestamps as well. Now, this is the same kind of concept. It is an epoch, but this format measures the number of 100 nanosecond increments, which are called ticks, since January 1st, but in the year 1601, also at midnight UTC. You can see an example of one of these timestamps right here that represents the same value that we saw previously. Now, in looking at this, you might wonder, first of all, what Microsoft Windows system was in operation in 1601? Obviously, that predates any kind of computer whatsoever. But this date was not just chosen at random. And the story behind this is that the Gregorian calendar, which most of us use nowadays, is aligned in these 400 year increments. And the year 1601 was the first year of the 400 year Gregorian calendar increment during which Microsoft Windows NT was first released. So it was essentially the dawn of that 400 year block during which Microsoft Windows came into being. As for why it's in 100 nanosecond increments, that actually goes beyond the scope of what we can cover here. It's actually a very, very low level computing design decision that was made, but it's a really cool rabbit hole to chase if this is the kind of thing that interests you. You can certainly do some research on that. But from a DFIR perspective, you're probably not going to encounter this in its native form. It's not typically used in any kind of logs. And the good news is that any of the tools we have that do parse this out of those Active Directory or file system artifacts are typically going to turn those back into human readable format before it's presented to us. But it is still important for us to know this is a real timestamp and this is one that is very commonly used in forensic practices. The last timestamp we're gonna take a look at here is actually my preferred timestamp format, which is defined as a standard in ISO 8601 and further covered in RFC form by RFC 3339. The reason both of these exist is very nuanced, but it basically amounts to the fact that the ISO standard is the ultimate source of truth, and then the RFC is a specific implementation of that standard with some additional rules and kind of constraints put around it. For general purposes, we could refer to this time format as either ISO 8601 or RFC 3339, but in most of our use cases, the technically more specific, more correct one is that it is the RFC that we're implementing in most of our logs, and that's most of what you'll encounter in your DFIR work. This format is ideal, in my view, for a couple of reasons. First of all, all time units, from the year all the way down to milliseconds, microseconds, and nanoseconds, or even more granular components are represented in the timestamp. 
It's also fixed width, meaning you have a fixed number of character counts, which kind of makes your logs look a little bit neat. And it also includes a time zone indicator. Well, there are two variations of timestamp indicator. You see the examples that we have here reflect both of them. This can be an, either an offset from UTC in the number of minutes, uh, hours and minutes, or this can simply be the letter Z, which indicates that it is in UTC format. Another great feature here is this is perfectly human readable in its native form, and it's also easily sorted because each of these time components is in big endian order, which means the largest time unit years is right up front, and then we get more, more fine-grained and more small increments as we move to the right. This means just like we can sort those Unix epoch times, we can also sort these RFC 3339 times, and we're going to get that chronological order. It's also completely unambiguous. And this is by far my favorite form. My favorite reason for this form is there's really no way to misinterpret this. There's none of that month versus day nonsense that we talked about earlier. It's really something that can simplify our workflow. And of course, when it comes to any kind of DFIR work, anything that is unambiguous is going to simplify what we do, simplify our casework and improve the confidence that we can have in our findings. So with all this variability for something as simple and seemingly straightforward as a timestamp, which one is quote unquote right? Well, unfortunately, I have to give you what I like to call the computer science answer, which is it depends. There are obviously many different factors in the decision that a developer or an engineer makes on which timestamp format for them to include in their software application or platform or tool or log format. And it would never be practical for us to dictate one singular format for everybody to use across such a wide variety of countless use cases. So rather than lament or complain about the lack of standardization that we have here, we have to appreciate that forensic analysis can be really hard for a lot of reasons like this. This is a very uh, a, a low level example of that complexity, but this concept of variable evidence extends greatly into a lot of different forms that we're going to be looking at. And in the DFIR world, we can't often influence what formats our evidence are going to use. So it's far more important for you to be aware of the variety of formats you might encounter. But if you can influence your organization's data formatting decisions, maybe as a finding in your investigation or a suggestion in a forensic report, RFC 3339 really does provide the most extensive and unambiguous format possible. I generally recommend this format for those reasons, and I also configure that wherever possible on the platforms I manage. It gives me a much greater level of assurance in the logs that I'm investigating. Thanks for watching, and I hope you've learned a thing or two about timestamps and that you'll be better prepared to interpret those that you might encounter in logs and other DFIR evidence that you come across in your work. Please do let me know what you think and what other interesting time formats you might run across as well. I've got a bunch more cool material in store for you, so please subscribe to make sure that you've got all the latest and greatest. Thanks again for joining, and we'll see you next time.